Okay. So hi everyone. So thanks for staying so late for the talk. Uh, yeah. Uh, my name is Leandro, and I work um, at R as a DevOps engineer. One of the main things we do is basically support the compiler teams and the tool chains in general on building uh, CI testing and benchmark with actual hardware. Uh, I'm also a contributor for LNT, which is a performance tracking tool for the LLVM. Uh, and the idea uh, for today is to give you one more tool for your toolbox when investigating issues with the compiler or the tool chain in general. So basically, when we are investigating some issue or the tool chain is playing up, Clang is crashing or something, or any tool is crashing, one key information when investigating it, if you have the repositories or you are a contributor to that, you are really interested in finding which commit cause that behave, changing behavior. So that information, even if you are not an expert on that, that part of the tool, you can understand a little bit more about what's happening. Then uh, the process in which you can, you can use like a methodology to do that. And one of the ways you can do is try to investigate uh, like the previous versions and try to find out this exact uh, version in which the thing was working and then stopped working. Uh, one problem with that is that in projects like LLVM Clang, in which we can have more than 100 commits a day, it's like very time consuming. Uh, and for that reason, many tools, as it's a very routine and repetitive process, there are many tools that can help us to achieve this. Uh, a little bit of theory then. So the code by section is this process of looking backwards in your, on a given repository trying to find a change in behavior, a specific change in behavior. Can be crashes, can be performance regressions, uh, and you might as well be looking for when something was fixed so it was not working and now it is working and I, I, I'm interested to know who fixed it or if the fix was a side effect of, a, of another change. Um, then. Uh, in order to run bisect or any bisecting process, you need basically two things. The first one is to have a repository in which you have a relationship uh, of, uh, of the relationship with changes. So there was this original change, then there was this subsequent change, and then this one and this, this one on like on a timeline fashion. And also, we need some test case or some way to label these given versions as this is a bad version or this is a good version. So as you have changes happening over time, you basically are interested to see, so on the latest one, so basically something that's not working, uh, then you go backwards and you go backwards and that until you find somebody or some version that in which the thing was working, then you can restrict your search space to that region and then you rerun the process until you will find the very specific version in which you have that thing working. Uh, usually, when talking about source code, we are uh, looking for a specific commit and commit is tightly connected to source control. So it's natural that source control offers some sort of bisecting. Then uh, pro, uh, Git, SVN, Mercurial, and others, they offer a bisecting option. Um, it's good because you have all the information that you are looking for on that repository, so you can run bisection and look for very specific changes. You can also, so the source control, it doesn't know what, which, uh, what is the expected behavior for that code, it's just a repository. But this gives you full flexibility to build that code if needed uh, in a very customized way for, to fit your needs. On the flip side, you need to rebuild it and you need to tell it, so this is the specific way I want to build. And this can, makes, it can make things a little bit difficult when you want to share this information with other people because you have all your local environment and, and the influences of your local environment when doing this. Also, not all versions are able to build. 
So if you look for some, uh, let's say, out of 100 changes on the compiler, you have some of these versions that are not possible to build because they are broken versions. Uh, then, uh, as I said, you, you need to set up the whole thing. You need to build it. You need to run your things. If you want to have a clean build each time, you need to set it up and clean up things as you need. Uh, and in big projects, uh, it can be very time consuming. When you have a big code base that takes a little bit long, uh, more than a few minutes to build, and a lot of changes. So your search space is actually very big. Then, there, uh, as we have a big code base and lots of commits, there is the need, or uh, there was a need, to, to have a specialized tool in order to run by section on Clung and LVM. And this was created uh, three years ago. Uh, and this tool is LLVM Lab Bisect. So we, using this tool, you have a specific environment to triage uh, or bisect uh, bugs or regressions in general on LLVM and Clung code base. So as I said, so this tool was contributed by Chris Matthews and, and Daniel three years ago. They, they are both uh, at Apple. This tool is uh, written in Python and is a specialized tool to bisect Clung and LLVM. There is documentation uh, on GitHub. You, you can find the documentation is very comprehensive. In order to install it is a, is a Python package. I recommend you use a virtual environment. Uh, then it's basically those steps in, in blue. So you clone, you, you, you install, and you have it. So I didn't say it before, but I, I'm running a few uh, demos during the talk, and my demos are running on a Raspberry Pi. So uh, we can actually uh, run this tool. This tool is completely supported by any Python 2 or 3 environment that you may have. So let me find the first thing. Yeah, this one. So I already installed this on, on a virtual environment, and following that steps. So I have one uh, virtual environment in directory B. So I will source that thing, being activate, and then I will have LLVM lab, and then I will have the the whole tool already running. So as I said, this is my Raspberry Pi. It's an ARM v7 running Linux, and that's. As simple as that. So yeah, so installation, basic usage for LLVM lab. You need uh, basically one thing. You need one test case to reproduce the, the failure you are investigating. So when you call this, you will call LLVM bisect, and then you will provide the, the test case. I'll, I will show you how to do that. But when you run any uh, test case, so no matter what test case you are running or options that you provide, you will basically do four things. One, it will download, download builds from uh, build cache. I'll, I'll tell you more about that in a, in a moment. Uh, it, will run a, it will create a sandbox with that version. It will run the test case, and then it will nav navigate through the repository doing that process that I showed before with the timeline labeling versions and finding the specific commit we want. Uh, a few concepts that are involved. The first one and one of the most important for the sake of uh, LLVM lab by SEC and is the main argument for using that is saving time by using it. So the build cache is a, is, is a cache uh, full of pre-built packages with the tool chain. So basically, uh, CI systems, so continuous integration systems, are Jen uh, Jenkins or, and BuildBot generate these packages. Uh, there are many types of packages that, that you can use out of the box, like x86 packages, ARMv7, and ART64. Uh, they are stored on Google Cloud Storage, so they are, you can download them. And then this is something that we did recently. We added support for ARMv7 and ART64 like three months ago. And then uh, these packages are being populated um, very often. So I'll show you how, how we do that. So 
for every commit that you do that goes to the main repository, um, we, will, we will have a build bot server, so the upstream uh, build bot will keep polling the SVN repository each two minutes, and then if it sees some changes on, on either Clang, LLVM, libraries, uh, and a few repositories, we'll trigger builds on native uh, ARM uh, builders, so there are other uh, x86 builders that are not maintained by us. These are the ones that we, as infrastructure team at ARM, maintain. So there is uh, one native AR32 and one uh, AR64 build builder that will upload the binaries and packages for Google Cloud Storage that will be available. Uh, so as I said, this works very uh, often. So each two minutes, it pulls the repository. And it's important for us to have these packages being created quite quickly. So we got two very uh, beefy uh, AR machines or ARM machines. And then we can complete this process and have from a given commit to the build cache, you have them in 16 minutes more or less. This is the build bot job that is uh, live and, and upstream. So you have the, also the configurations for what this job does on Zorg, which is a repository for infrastructure code and builds and automation uh, inside, uh, within an LLVM. Uh, then you have all, this, all these builds. You'll see many of these builds uh, every day to have as many versions as possible to narrow down the, uh, well, the resolution of the results of the bisection process. So you have very specific commits as much as possible. So, when running by uh, bisection processes using LLVM lab, you need to, to pick a repository in which the tool we will we use to download builds. So there are many. Uh, we are, if you don't say any repository, it, it will use one x86, x86 repository and download things to run locally. Uh, oh, there are two of them that we are interested in this talk, which are these two ones. So uh, Clang AR64 and ARMv7, which are the ones that we are publishing things. Uh, in order to pick a specific repository, we want to uh, tell uh, uh, an option dash B and point to the specific repository uh, with these ones. I'll show you that. What are the CMake ones? Are those the old ones that we were doing before? Probably, you probably yes. See those. Yes, so we only have rights to publish things. That's why we didn't remove anything or we didn't criticize anything. But we, <laughs> we say uh, LLVM uh, VM Lab LS. So it's pretty fast and you can, you can have the production ones. There are no restrictions. If you install the command line tools, you have access to the whole thing. So there is no, there is no thing difficult or, or that you need to ask permission for. Then there is a, the other important thing is the sandbox. So the sandbox is uh, the temporary location in which for every time you download a given version, you have this directory uh, with the whole tool chain. So you'll be able to just uh, with the time that you need to download and extract this package, that, that's the time you need setting up your uh, test environment. Uh, this is important to say, by default sandboxes are deleted after the, the end of the process, but uh, you can save them by providing dash s uh, and then providing a directory. By default they go to slash temp and they get deleted which uh, sometimes if, if you are like trying out your bug reproducer, it can be like a waste of time if, if it takes like 10 minutes to run the whole thing. You can save time uh, by providing a custom sandbox directory. The other important bit uh, that I'll go quickly is the predicates. So these are basically the command lines that you run to reproduce uh, your, the behavior you are looking for. So you can, by the, the simplest uh, usage, you have LLVM lab bisect, and then you say, this line fails. Find me where uh, 
this was working before, if any, right? So you can have a, a very simple command line that will trigger different versions and navigate through this repository, and then it will give you the, the revisions that you are looking for. So as you can see, there is something that's uh, quite different here, which is this bit, the percent uh, path string. And this is basically, it will be uh, substituted by or replaced by any, by any version that you are trying out. So it will get that specific version path, then it will run the clunk from, from that sandbox. So it will get replaced by the tool so you can test many versions. Uh, and also, uh, there is not only the variable path, so there are, there are many other variables that you can use to, in, uh, to implement your test cases. You can also use all your previous knowledge on shell and pipes and uh, output into files, grepping, and all your previous knowledge can be used to, to help you. And this is very useful when you, when you are trying to uh, troubleshoot something. So the, you can use it uh, in two ways. One is via the command line that you use the Python printf syntax, which is that one. You can also have it run as a shell script. And in that way, when calling the shell script, I will show it, uh, you will get these variables injected. So these for the whole list that I showed before. Um, so this is how you call it on command lines, uh, just inline. Or you can say, run this shell script. And the shell script will have the variables in that, that format. Uh, you can also, uh, so that variables are when you are running the test, you get those variables. After you finish the test, you can also use test filters. So you can see for that specific test case whether the test passed or failed. You get a result on a variable called result. And you can also have the time measurements uh, as in user time, uh, system time, and wall time. So this is the way you can use it. So you can say for that given test case, if it passed and user time was less than half a second, then you can, you can you use that expression to evaluate whether this test case was passing or not. This is useful when you are running benchmarks. So you are, if you are trying to see why a given benchmark progressed or something, uh, you can compile uh, that benchmark with that version of the, the toolchain and then run it. So you can just do a command, semicolon, run it, and then you, you get this uh, results as an output. There are other uh, useful command lines, if you like. So there is very verbose reuse sandbox, which, uh, which, makes, uh, which saves time by keeping the sandboxes, the temporary sandboxes, so you can reuse them. So this is something that we are upstreaming as part of the preparation of this talk. So I, I was trying so many uh, bisections and they were taking long, so I externalized this option as part of this. So you can restrict versions, so you can make the bisection process um, to run faster. So I have a few, uh, couple demonstrations. I think I'll, I'll show one of them. Uh, and then I, I, uh, you have the slides and you can reproduce the other. So the first one is an actual uh, bug uh, open in, on Clang. So Clang crashes when calling a function uh, while both omitting a parameter and misspelling a parameter. So I can show you that one. So control B. W, demo one, cut, uh, test.c. So when you provide this, uh, you have the parameter that is unused and another thing which is not non-existent, two chain will crash. Then the way to reproduce it, let me show you. Cut, uh, start.sh. So this is basically the way I am running it. Oh, 
uh, I have this command line better, in a better format. So this is the way I'm, I'm running this bisection process. So I'm calling LLVM bisect, I'm calling reuse sandbox, so, I, so it won't download things and extract things on my local machine. It's just to speed up the process for demonstration purposes. I set a given max revision that I have done previously downloaded, custom sandbox, and this is the reproducer. So I'm calling a shell, work length is this thing. I got all this information on the bug report. And then uh, what I want to find to say that a given version is working, I, I want to get an undeclared def uh, identifier rather than a crash. So let me show you this thing. Oh. What is it? Um, so this is the bug report. So what it does, uh, it basically will well crash the, the whole tool chain. And what, I, when, what we are looking for is a undeclared identifier. So uh, I would just run this thing. And you will see that it will start, uh, well, it's not, not very useful, but you will see many fails, uh, and you will see a few passes. So it is limiting the search space. So it is failing, failing, failing until it passes. Then, OK, it reruns the process on that uh, space as well. So in the end, uh, it will say that client revision this number, this timestamp, is the first working build, and this one, uh, this timestamp, is the next failing build. So it was working in this revision, and it was not working anymore on this revision. So that's the output you get for anything that you want to troubleshoot. So. Yeah, it should be the last working build. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, not the first working build. But that's just a message. Oh, okay, yeah, but I think the first working build, it's, it's seen from latest to oldest. So it's the first working build from in the opposite direction. And not the last one from the source, I guess. That's, that's the so meaning the, of the, the message. The version was three less. Well, yeah, but this is because it polls the repository each two minutes, so we can get a uh, smaller resolution than one yeah, single commit. It pulls from the wrong side. It's just yeah. the last, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, okay so... Uh, yeah, I just need a, one more minute, just to a few discussions. So there is, uh, just to summarize the, the gains that we will have on, on time spent um, on bisection. If we, that, that uh, demonstration I did, I have already cached the download, the versions, and I have already extracted that versions. So it runs very, really uh, artificially quick because I have everything pre-cached. In a real world, on a Raspberry Pi, uh, it will take around three minutes to uncompress. That's the, the most time is spent on that thing. Uh, I have a few suggestions on how to fix that in the future, but still, three minutes is not so bad. And if we do that in real world, we will have one hour and 10 uh, minutes to test 23 tool chains uh, times three minutes each, more or less. But on the other side, comparing this with the time we uh, usually spend on creating the build cache items, which is more or less 10 minutes, uh, we will, to do the same process, we will have almost four hours to, to run the whole thing, considering we get that specific versions that we know that are possible to build, and we run the same like jumping through versions to optimize the process. So this is basically uh, two hours and 40 minutes that you get, more or less, com in this comparison. Uh, also, that we are always uh, having versions that will build and will work. Yeah, Andrew, so the 10 minute build time, that's on the, because I happen to know that's on the 64 core, pretty high end server. Yes. It's on your Raspberry Pi, probably that would be, <laughs> I guess, hours. more than 24 hours. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Three hours could turn into more than 24 hours. Yeah, that's, pro that's probably more. I'm, I'm just not considering that we are building on a Raspberry Pi because that would be like, Great. yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so that's the thing. We are building on a very high-end uh, machine. I will, I will tell you a little bit about that machine. Uh, uh, and then still, 
if we compare Raspberry Pi versus Raspberry Pi, then it will be like days versus hours, right? To, to have all the all those versions. And I'm I'm talking about 10 minutes because we are building from scratch. This is not an incremental build, so this is a very high-end machine. Uh, so this is the demonstration number two. I, I'll just skip that. Uh, so. As final remarks, so automated bisecting is a valuable tool to have on your toolbox to troubleshoot things on the uh, tool chain. Uh, we can save time by using LLVM lab bisect, as we just saw. And we recently added ARMv7 and ART64. So there is also this move within the, the LLVM community to move from SVN to Git. And then this will impact tools like that that rely on revision versions. So I, I sent a message to Chris Matthews a few weeks ago, and we are uh, discussing about that, getting ideas. And With the monorepo, that's not going to be a big deal. Yeah. It would be a huge deal if it was a multi-repo, whatever that was called before. Yeah. Yeah, monorepo is actually probably simpler, because you can use git bisect. Yes. Yeah, and, and also we don't, we don't really need to track the revision number versions to trust that in, in this scenario. We can just get the, like, the Continuous integration to build ID or something yeah. that is shared and, and known. So the machine, these machines that we've got uh, for the LLVM pro, uh, project, these, um, these machines are actually free, and each and every open source project can request some of them. This is an initiative called Works on Arm, uh, which offers uh, machines uh, or remote machines that you can use, so very powerful machines to try your continuous integration jobs and see they working uh, and supported on ARM in general. This is the URL. You can request resources, opening uh, basically a GitHub issue. All instructions are on, on that website. And we use it, and these machines are very reliable. We have them running for months without any problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We have those machines as well, and they are extremely reliable. Yeah. So we use them, uh, two machines. Um, one is a Thunder X2 and one is a, uh, oh, a Thunder X1. Uh, and the other one is a, another high-end machine. High 1616. Yeah, this one, yeah. Uh, yeah, and that's it for me. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Yeah, so, so the question is about though the, the test cases in which you have tools like file check and not and the, the, those things, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, you know, and I, I didn't test with any of them, but yeah, I think you, you can, can find a way. If you have, if you have a, a bash script out of it, you, you can reproduce the thing very quickly. Yeah, and then you probably just need to change the places in which you need clung to have that path variable on it, and, and that's it, basically. Yeah? So one possible feature enhancement here is that, I'm guessing if you want to, for the moment, do x86, you need the x86 machines, ARM, you've got the ARM machines, you need no need to do what you've got your native build cache, but not everyone has that. So I imagine it could be possible for a lot of tools to re basically use Quenu, so if you kind of, um, have an option to integrate an emulator where you kind of say, run this test, but run it under an emulator, and then you could affect anyone mm. with an X86 machine could plug yeah. like an ARM program. So, yeah, so the first thing, on, the, on this way, so from the ARM machine, or from the x86 machine, run something on a QEMU, this is kind of already supported because you can have a bash script, and if you can do that on a bash script, you can do that on, on this. Maybe just the documentation. Probably. 
Yeah, and there is also a curiosity on this, is that we build uh, also the backend for x86, so you can use on your ARM machine, you can uh, generate the x86 binaries and, and even if you have a way to, to run them, you, you can do that as well. Yeah? Thank you again. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much. <laughs>